Good day. Um, it, it looks like the, the folks are logging in. Um, we are going to have quite an audience today, uh, which makes us proud. Uh, my name is Adam Sadowski. I'm from Smart for Aviation, and I am very happy to be here today. On behalf of uh, the Aviation Hub community, I would like to warmly welcome you all on the third Aviation Hub webinar this year. Um, the Hub is the community built upon enthusiasm, knowledge, and experience in the field of aviation. Um, we were founded in November 2019 by Invest and Pomerania, Boeing, Dynsk Airport, and uh, Smart for Aviation. Uh, we're expanding since and have new partnership established like with Lufthansa Systems, for instance. Um, aviation Hub is a regional cluster of aviation-related companies in Pomerania. Uh, our main goal is to promote the domain on both ends, um, technical and business. And currently, aviation-related companies in the region employ around 1.5 thousand of people, and our aim is to grow, as simple as that. Um, today, uh, Suavec will take you on a trip much closer to the heart of operational control center of an airline, and will excite you with his own experience in flight dispatching. Enjoy it and feel free to raise questions during the presentation. Um, there will be a time slot for a Q&A session afterwards. So whenever you feel like asking for more, just use the chat box and put there your questions. Enjoy the show. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, warm welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Swavik Elisa and I'm a flight dispatcher and a aircraft performance engineer with about 20 years of experience in aviation at uh, this time. Aviation was always my passion since I was a small kid. And uh, since I was not able to become a professional pilot, I looked for a possibility to work in aviation because uh, as maybe not everyone knows, but not only pilots are required to uh, make the flight operations possible. Uh, today, I would like to uh, take you for a short trip uh, regarding aviation jobs, of course. Uh, one of them are quite obvious, but I'm sure that some of the jobs are maybe new to some of you and uh, that we can uh, show that uh, not only those guys that you can see on the front line of flight operations are those uh, who are responsible for the uh, aviation uh, operations performance. So what we would, um, what we will uh, show you today, we'll go to the agenda right now. So. Can we, can we go to the next screen because I can, okay, thank you. So, um, as I said, we will make a short introduction to the aviation jobs that we have today, um, of course, but I will mainly focus on the job of a, a flight dispatcher, because this is uh, one of the jobs that is very uh, unknown to the public. And whenever someone is asking, uh, well, what are you doing as a flight dispatcher? Are you working in a control tower? No. Are you working on an apron? No. So what are you actually doing? Well, you will find out after this uh, presentation. I will also um, present you the possibilities how to uh, become a flight dispatcher, what training is needed, um, what professional profile should a, a flight dispatcher have. Uh, and of course, I will also uh, say a few words about um, the training possibilities here in Poland. Uh, of course, we'll focus on Polish market because we are in Poland, so I think it is most uh, interesting to our uh, to our audience. So let's start with the uh, presentation of the aviation jobs, and uh, I think that the first most uh, obvious aviation job are the pilots. Uh, everybody know that to fly an aircraft there is a pilot required. Uh, well, actually, well, actually, at least two pilots in commercial operations, in most commercial operations, because only in very small aircraft, there is uh, a possibility that only one pilot will fly the uh, commercial aircraft with, with passengers or cargo on board. But generally, you need two, uh, at least two uh, pilots to have on board. Sometimes it's even more when there's a long-haul long flight, for example. 
and the duty time is longer than, for example, 13 hours, then we have, then we must have more than three crew members uh, in the flight deck. But generally, we can say that we need two pilots um, on board. Pilots are also these pilots are also those guys who are very well recognized. You know, they are wearing, wearing nice uniforms, working for the airports, um, sitting in the cockpit. So the passengers, whenever embarking the aircraft or walking through the aircraft, they are seeing that they are um, pilots. They are also, of course, uh, extremely important. They are crucial for the operations. So um, although it is possible theoretically to uh, for an for an aircraft to be flown. Uh, without the pilot, because we have, of course, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, but uh, not for passenger transportation, not for commercial operations uh, right now. And the reason for that is not that it's not possible to um, to fly this aircraft totally automatically, because even the aircraft we have mm, today, mm, they are... Um, very well automatized. And regard, uh, beside the takeoff, all the flight up to the landing could be performed totally automatically. So one can say, okay, maybe we don't need the pilots anymore in the cockpit. But this is absolutely not the uh, way for this. Because the main goal of the pilot on the cockpit is to react in case of an abnormal situation. The pilot is working in a life environment in a, a very rapidly changing uh, situation. And when the flight, when the weather is good, when everything goes okay, then one can say, even if one have possibility to enter the cockpit during a normal re regular flight and say, okay, there's nothing going on here. What are the guys doing? They're watching TV, nothing else. But that's not the truth. They are supervising the flight and they are reacting in case uh, anything goes wrong. They are ready and they are trained. They're very well trained to react uh, in a way that will save the uh, life, of course, in the first way, and but also the aircraft and the, and the payload. So pilots, they're definitely the uh, most important part of an uh, aviation industry. Uh, but they don't, they do not need any advertisement. There's a lot of movies made about pilots and uh, also uh, regarding military pilots. So uh, I think that no one will uh, say that uh, if, if you have to think about the job aviation with, uh, with a job uh, related to aviation, I think the pilot will be the first one. Um, well, what do you have then? Then we have a counterpart of the pilot on the ground, which is the air traffic controller. Uh, the air traffic control is uh, quite similar position to the pilots, although those guys are sitting in control centers on the ground and not in the air, but they are also directly involved in the live operations. Um, they're also working on live environment they also have to react immediately in case of any danger of or uh, in case of any disturbance of uh, operations uh, and also it depends on the situation because if there is a calm day the traffic is quite nice the weather is good there are no delays it may look that uh, everything is so going so flawless but if there is any mm, dangerous situation of if anything goes wrong they are ready absolutely ready to um, to help the crew in the air to get the aircraft safely down. And uh, it has, has been proved many, many times that the correct uh, help from the, air, from the air traffic control helped to save the aircraft and the, and the passengers. Regarding to air traffic controllers, there is a quite um, difference between in regards of training, because if you want to be a pilot, then you have a possibility to join many pilot schools around the world. Even, even in Poland, there are many of them where you can do a um, professional pilot license. Uh, but if you want to be a traffic controller, then you have to join a mostly state organization. Uh, which is responsible for air traffic control in the country. For example, in Poland, this is Polska Agencja Żeglugi Pomiecznej. This is a state-owned enterprise. And if you want to be an air traffic control, then you have to apply there and make the trainings, pass state exam, of course, get a license. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are no private uh, possibilities to, to work or to make the train, uh, like in the case of, um, of, of uh, the pilots. Um, Okay, what do we have then? After the tra air traffic controllers, we have the flight attendants. And 
of course. Uh, mm, this is also the aviation job that is very close to, to the passengers uh, because they are working with the passengers. So they are even closer to the uh, passengers than the pilots because the pilots sit in the cockpit and um, they are not um, available, so to say, for the whole flight for the passengers. But the flight attendants are. So um, they are ready, they are there to help the, the, the passengers to mm, make the flight uh, safe and of course, uh, as comfortable as, as possible. But what is very important here in this case, uh, that we have to remember that the flight attendants, they are not waiters in the sky. So they are not there to serve us the coffee or a sandwich, but they are there to look after our uh, safety. And their positions, their uh, job is crucial in case of, for example, an emergency situation or an evacuation because uh, they have to lead in such a case, for example, if you have an emergency landing and then uh, we need an, to perform an evacuation, uh, how they lead the evacuation, uh, this may be crucial to the effect of the evacuation. And also there are many, many accidents um, in the history of aviation where it showed that an extremely well-trained uh, personnel uh, uh, flight attendants that they uh, saved the lives of, of uh, passengers because after the land landing you can say that uh, mostly the the role of the of the air crew so from the, of the pilot is done they have brought the aircraft to the safe stop but then the board uh, has to be uh, evacuated and if you have for example 300 or 400 passengers on board this could be a big issue. So we should really treat also the flight attendants with a uh, big respect uh, because it's very, very demanding and uh, responsible job uh, as well. Here, with if you want to be a flight attendant, it's also, uh, it looks quite similar to the pilots because you have to find a job, a company uh, for which you would like to, to work and then you have to do the training at the at their uh, training organization at such a company. Uh, I wanted to say that the flight attendant is a non-licensed uh, flight personnel, so you don't have a license for uh, being uh, a flight attendant. Uh, okay, what we have then? Uh, we have then uh, a lot of uh, maintenance uh, guys. There are people who are both in line maintenance. So there are those guys who are treating the aircraft before every departure, making the line checks uh, every evening or for a, before every flight, sometimes if it's required. Uh, they are fixing uh, the aircraft if it's possible, uh, short, even on short notice before departure. But also those, those are those guys who are working in the maintenance centers, performing the heavy maintenance of uh, aircrafts. Um, because every aircraft has to uh, go through heavy maintenance during uh, pre-described time uh, periods. And uh, sometimes such a uh, maintenance can take even two or three months if it's a complete overhaul. Uh, so it's hundreds and hundreds of people uh, working there. They must be extremely well trained extremely well qualified because the modern aircrafts are very, very complicated and sophisticated machines. So uh, there is a really big effort taken to train those guys um, so that, that, that they can uh, do their job uh, safely. Uh, okay, uh, then we have, of course, uh, a lot of guys working in uh, so generally set operations. So we have load masters, handling agents, uh, starting from the lady at, or the man <laughs> at the uh, counter where you check in, where through the um, uh, through the room where the baggage is uh, collected and put to in lo loaded to the aircraft through the load masters who are preparing the load sheets. And also to uh, guys sitting in the airlines, uh, like, for example, the performance engineer, who are also I am, uh, who are responsible, for example, for airport, airport analysis or uh, takeoff and landing calculations uh, or also in-flight calculations for any flight. Uh, because it is also a crucial factor, performance is also a crucial factor for airport operations, because as one can imagine, uh, not every aircraft can operate on any 
uh, airport and in any conditions. So every, for example, for a takeoff, a lot of factors must be taken into the account, uh, weather conditions, wind, runway state, uh, takeoff mass and everything. And this has to be calculated and then the pilot will know if he can uh, perform this flight or not. Or for example, maybe he has too much uh, payload and he has to unload. So maybe if someone had a situation in his life that his bug was not taken with him on this flight, uh, it's not always that because the loading agent has maybe forgotten or has something mistaken during the loading and the baggage travels somewhere else. Maybe some, maybe it was intentionally uh, due to loading restrictions uh, from the aircraft. And sometimes it is necessary some, uh, simply to uh, unload the, uh, the aircraft to make the flight po possible. Um, okay, so I think finally we came to the job of the flight dispatcher because we, we said already that the pilot uh, have a route. They, they, they uh, got a flight plan with a pre-described pre route that he have um, uh, fuel figures so he know how much fuel uh, he had to take. So the fuel guy know how much, how much fuel should he or she uh, put into the aircraft. But we may ask a question, where do the values come from? Who prepares them? Are they somewhere pre-described? Are there any maps or charts that the pilot can take? Okay, so today we are flying, for example, from Gdańsk to Warsaw, so we can take this and this way and we'll go like with a bus or with a car. Well, yes and no. So yes, there are, of course, charts, <laughs> aeronautical charts. There are airways, although we are uh, at this moment um, uh, getting to so-called through through route uh, airspace. So we are uh, not uh, trying not to use any uh, longer airways, but uh, only direct points, which will uh, which should uh, help to uh, uncongest the airspace. But of course, airways are still used. So yes, we do have charts, and uh, yes, it is possible to uh, um, to plan a route on a chart, and this is what the dispatcher is doing. But this is not the pilot job to to do it. So the flight dispatcher is responsible for preparation of a um, suitable and uh, feasible uh, operational uh, route. Such a route must take into account not only not only the uh, economical conditions, so of course, because innovation would like to make uh, ma money. It's quite obvious, and uh, this is my, our actually one of our main goals. But we also have to take care about the weather and route. We have to maybe avoid some um, significant uh, weather, uh, like thunderstorms, which we basically cannot plan to fly through. And uh, this is something what the flight dispatcher has to look um, after. The flight dispatcher has also to uh, plan the fuel. So he will take into account the winds that are uh, in the air, because uh, the air mass in which we are planning is not a standing mass, which is quite obvious. We have winds, and the higher we are flying, the winds are stronger. And uh, when the winds are stronger, then we have we can have uh, a he headwind or a tailwind. Uh, a headwind will be, of course, uh, not good for us, because if we have a headwind, then we have uh, to burn more fuel. Uh, if we have a tailwind, then we have to then we can burn less fuel. Every, all this has to be taken into account during the flight plan preparation. So we can sometimes uh, choose maybe a route that was, is uh, in a ground distance, a little, bit, a little bit maybe longer. But if we take into account uh, winds, then it could be uh, cheaper to fly because we will use less fuel and we will fly shorter. And this is, of course, mainly on... Uh, longer routes visible because if we have one or two hour flight the differences are not so big but on uh, longer routes on long haul flights especially the differences can sometimes be uh, quite quite impressive like 30 40 minutes just using the the uh, proper wind component that we can uh, that we can use um, what else uh, the dispatcher also has also to plan the um, alternate aerodromes Although alternate aerodromes are not absolutely necessary for all the operation, 
is depending on the situation, on the weather situation, and also on the requirements that are written in the uh, in the uh, operation man manual of a ca carrier. But uh, it's uh, uh, a very important part to look after the weather on the airports. So both of the the destination aerodrome as on the uh, alternate aerodrome. And if we have an alternate aerodrome, then we have to also check if this aerodrome is uh, okay for our operations and if we can uh, divert to this aerodrome in case of, uh, for example, uh, a weather, uh, bad weather at our uh, destination uh, aerodrome. Of course, this is not all. This all those tasks are today not uh, done ma man manually. Although theoretically, the dispatcher should be able to uh, perform all these uh, checks and all these calculations manually. This is something that we are trained for, uh, and uh, even a few years ago, the exam, the practical exam, was was to. Uh, uh, make it on the paper, uh, but uh, today, of course, and in uh, real life operations, we are using uh, sophisticated software. There is a lot of uh, manufacturers that produce the software. There's Jepson, uh, Jet Planner software. There is Airbus Navblue, and there is, of course, the uh, Lufthansa Lido uh, flight system. Uh, in such a system, we have a big uh, help to plan a flight because the route planning is mostly automatic. Of course, we can interrupt it in any time and we can also adjust the route even if the route is uh, proposed by the system. We can uh, make some adjustments. What we usually do uh, because some, this is only a machine and still there is a, <laughs> a space for the human to, to interact and to make some adjustments, to make something better. Um, sometimes the pilot might have some suggestions, for example, for a route. Sometimes he may say or she that he would like to fly this quite different, this way or that way, and then we have to adjust the route. Mm, the weather checks uh, are also performed um, man manually, although systems like Lido do perform an automatic weather check. So the weather forecasts and weather reports are taken automatically into consideration by the system, but still the dispatcher uh, has to, uh, it's his duty to check this um, um, this re requirements for, for, uh, for the weather. So uh, we cannot rely only on the uh, automation. Uh, fuel calculations and performance files. This is, of course, everything built into the uh, into the software. So we just have to select an aircraft from the list, uh, and uh, then we have all the uh, parameters that are taken for the calculation. Because it's, I think, it's quite obvious that um, uh, you have different fuel consumption, for example, for an Airbus A320 than for an Airbus A380, and the same for an empty Airbus for A320 or for a fully loaded Airbus A320. So this all this has to be taken into account. Uh, of course, if there would be something wrong with, <laughs> with the software, we can, as I said in the beginning, we can do it manually, and we can even uh, perform the uh, fuel calculations manually. Uh, we have tables for this. Uh, the tables are provided by the aircraft manufacturers. Uh, so we, in case we do not have access to the software, we can go to the uh, tables that are available in, to the, in the aircraft manuals uh, and take the values from the tables. Of course, in such a case, uh, the values in the tables are very conservative. So this is also quite obvious. I think, and this is a common practice in aviation, that uh, we would like to stay on the safe side. So it's, you know, someone says it's better better to be safe than so sorry. So we are also working this way. So if we do not have a very exact data, then we would like to stay on the safe side and take always the bigger value, uh, for example, in case of 
fuel planning. Uh, from the tools that we are using in our today's oper everyday operation uh, are also uh, satellite images, for example, <clears throat> for the uh, uh, weather forecasts. Uh, we also use uh, wind grip models, which are actually at this moment quite quite accurate. We have now predictions of winds, high altitude winds, um, for actually all levels or flight levels that we uh, use in, in civil aviation today. So up to flight level, I don't know, I think 460 or, or even 500. For every, actually, uh, for every um, part of the world. So even on remote areas like oceans, deserts, or even on the North Pole, we have a quite uh, predictable and quite accurate uh, forecast for this, uh, for our weather, for our winds. Because I mentioned, as I mentioned in the beginning, winds are very, very important for the uh, fuel planning, especially on on the longer, on longer flights. Uh, but the dispatcher job is not only to plan the flight. The, to plan the flight is only one of the tasks. So we have prepared the flight plan. We have selected the aircraft. We have checked uh, if the aircraft is fit to fly. Uh, we have checked that uh, the, we have correct amount of fuel calculated. You have selected the most optimum route and sent the documents to the pilot. The pilot accepted the documents. And the aircraft is now waiting for departure. But for example, in the meantime, there is calling a handing agent and is saying hello, but we have uh, 10 tons more cargo because um, some containers already arrived and you would like to take it. So what we can do in this case? Well, if it's 10 tons more of payload, then of course it will have an influence of a flight plan because both will change the fuel figures. We will have to take more fuel because we will burn more fuel is the one thing. But also, for example, the levels, the flight levels will change. If we have like I said, 10 tons heavier aircraft, uh, then uh, the flight levels will be will be lower. The aircraft won't be able to fly as high as it was uh, uh, planned originally. So in this case, we have to adjust the flight plan and to we are also responsible to uh, give this new uh, updated flight plan to the air crew. That the, and so we have to take care that the air crew, that the captain has always the latest, most actual uh, flight plan possible. In the, meantime, in the meantime, can also come to a situation that there are ATC slots. ATC slots, this is something that we really don't like and the passengers also don't like because those are delays. Delays at the airport, uh, which, are which may be caused by different reasons, for example, due to weather or due to airspace congestion. How does it work? It works in that way that, for example, we have an air, airspace, for example, in southern Pol Poland, and the air, this airspace has a given capacity. Like, for example, the controller who is sitting there can handle, let's say, 100 operations per hour only. And if there is planned, for example, 105 or 106 operations per hour, then he cannot accept those operations. So the aircrafts that are above the 100 they must get a delay. And the more the aircraft are planned in, in a given airspace, the more delay they can have. And this is often the reason that we sit on an airplane in the airport and the captain is saying, hello, good afternoon, we are ready for departure, everything is on board, but we have to wait, for example, 20 minutes for our departure clearance. This is the ATC slot, most likely due to ATC, uh, ATC uh, slot. And... Uh, well, one can ask, okay, this is an ATC slot, so what can a dispatcher, what have a dispatcher here to do? Well, actually, uh, he has, because sometimes if we have a big slot, and the slots can even go, not on 20 minutes is not a quite big slot, but you can have a slot of three or four hours even, and then it could be a problem, uh, then the dispatcher can try to find another route. So change the routing so that... Uh, uh, we will avoid, for example, a congested airspace or maybe a area with bad weather. This is uh, quite often in summer where there are thunderstorms here in Europe. And uh, if there is an airspace with huge thunderstorms where the aircrafts will have to uh, avoid the areas, so they have to 
uh, perform maneuvers to avoid the uh, areas with, with thunderstorms, then of course the capacity of the airspace drops dramatically and this leads to slope. So in this case also we can try, of course this is not, of, not always successful, uh, sometimes it doesn't give any, any result, but we can try to reroute the flight and maybe get rid of the slot or have the slot lower. So this is also part of our job. But even after, even after the aircraft departs, uh, so it's totally after the, uh, under the control of the air traffic control from the departure, uh, we still have contact with the crew. And we are there to support the crew in every aspect of the flight. We have modern means of communications. Uh, we have VHF, HF radio, depending on the airline. Uh, this is most likely was in the, in the some years ago, but today with the most modern uh, means of communication like uh, ACARS um, or data link and satellite communications, we have actually a, a continuous uh, two-way uh, communication with uh, air crew of aircraft in any part of the globe. Um, how can we support that crew during the flight? Well, there are many ways for this. For example, the crew uh, may ask for the weather en route, or they may also ask for a possibility of a, a rerouting if they know there, uh, that there is, a, uh, for example, area, a bigger area of back, of back uh, bad um, weather. So in such situation, we also can prepare for them a rerouting, although we cannot change the flight directly when it's in the flight, but we can pass such a new uh, adjusted flight plan to the crew and the crew can file this adjusted flight plan from the air and the flight plan then is valid. Uh, but we also have to react in case of a diversion, for example. So let's consider a situation that we have an aircraft that is flying to, uh, let's say, to Warsaw. But there is a bad weather in Warsaw and the airplane is diverting to Krakow due to weather. And then that we have, we have the, as the dispatcher have to uh, act accordingly. So uh, arrange the handling agents at Krakow and primarily make a decision what we have to do later. So should we wait in Krakow with the passengers on board and wait for the weather in Warsaw to improve? Or should we unload the passengers in Krakow and take them by bus or by train to Warsaw and the passengers from Warsaw to Krakow uh, by train and then by plane back to our uh, departure aerodrome? This is the main goal of the dispatcher job, to make the decision what to do. Because uh, in airlines, it also depends where are you a dispatcher. If you are a dispatcher in a big company, big airline like Lufthansa or Lot or any other big airline, or in a small charter airline or even in the business operator. If there is a small company, then the dispatcher has much, much more duties to do because in the small company, most likely the dispatcher will also have to uh, call the handling agent, arrange the handling at the, the diversion airport, um, arrange fuel and etc. In bigger companies, it's usually all arranged already. So the dispatcher does not have to um, take care uh, after this. But the decision making is also on the, the, the on the dispatcher. So should we wait? We have to look on the forecast, for example, in Warsaw and see, okay, we have a thunderstorm that will last for 20, 30 minutes, but after then the weather should be okay. So we will leave the aircraft and the passengers in Krakow. We will not uh, disembark the aircraft. We'll wait until the weather in Warsaw improve. And right after the weather is improved, we will just take some fuel if necessary from Krakow and fly to the destination as it was planned. So I think and I think that this is the one also of the most uh, exciting part of the uh, dispatcher's job because it's absolutely non-routine. Anything actually can uh, happen. I had once a situation in my professional life when I was alone on the duty in a charter airline and we had a flat airplane flying to Madeira from Warsaw and uh, the Madeira is very demanding airport due to winds. And once the wind there changed and it exceeds the limits and the aircraft could not land there and the aircraft landed at the only alternate that's in the area. It's on the, op on the opposite island on Porto Santo. And the pilot landed there and said, okay, 
Hi Slavic, we are in Porto Santo, what we do next? And then uh, we have to decide. I have to decide if we should, uh, what should we do? Should we disembark and leave the passengers? Will, will the weather in Madeira improve? The problem was also that there are another aircraft coming to Porto Santo because as I said, there is the only aerodrome in the area. So we have to arrange the fuel as soon as possible because the earlier we get the fuel, the earlier we can do part, the part to Madeira. Uh, there are also duty times problem for the crew because it's a long flight from Warsaw. So it was a danger that they won't be able to come back uh, to Warsaw the same day. So uh, this is something those are moments for which you actually are trained and for which you, so to say, wait during your uh, professional, professional life. But um, there are also other tasks that the dispatcher have uh, to do. Like, for example, you have to, but it's also, the, it's also depending on the, on the company you work for. Uh, you can also arrange uh, overfly permits because there are many countries in the world where you cannot fly just uh, based on a flight plan. You need an overfly permission or a landing permission. You can arrange uh, handling, so you can arrange fuel passenger accommodations and everything uh, what is needed but it's highly dependable on the on the company profile you work for if you work for example for a, a business aviation operator uh, then you have sometimes uh, also to arrange the limousine transport for the vip you have on board and you know all the all the all the stuff like this the crew the hotels for the crew of the of the flight so um in such companies, the dispatcher has much, much uh, more tasks to do. Mm, okay. So I think this is about the um, dispatcher work. What is the flight dispatcher uh, actually doing? And uh, uh, now we can say a few words, who can be a flight dispatcher? Well, first I have to say that there are actually three possibilities. You can have a... You can be a, a licensed dispatcher and then you are a dispatcher because you can be called a flight dispatcher only if you are, uh, have a license. So if you have a license, then you are a flight dispatcher. Uh, and you can be licensed according to two regulations. One is ICAO, so International Civil Aviation Organization. And this is the most uh, common used uh, license in the world. And the second one is FAA. So Federal Aviation Administration, the Americans, they have their own um, license. They have, of course, their own li license also for the pilots, etc., for whole aviation personnel, but also for the flight dispatchers. Uh, so the requirements and also the responsibility uh, area for the dispatcher is quite different between ICAO and FAA. But since we are in Poland, in Europe, we are focusing on the ICAO license. And in Poland, you can apply uh, for an ICAO license, similar in Germany, for example. But there are also countries where a flight dispatcher license is not issued. And uh, such a country is, for example, United Kingdom, where you do not have a flight, operation, a flight uh, dispatcher license. But of course, the airlines have their dispatchers, but they are not called dispatchers. They are called flight operations officers. So we can be a flight operations officer. We are not have a license. You are not licensed personnel. But you got the whole the training at the given company. So, for example, if you want to go to work in operations in British Airways and you want to be a flight operations officer there, so you can apply there, you can get a complete training at their, at their, uh, at their station, you will get a certificate that you are a flight operations officer. But the uh, bad side of this is that you have a certificate that allows you to work only in British Airways. So this is a company certificate. You are a flight operations officer at British Airways, for example. You cannot go with this flight operations officer certificate to any other company and say, OK, I would like to work here as a flight operations officer. No, this is only possible with a license, which is an international document and is recognized uh, according to regulations. Um, so who can be a dispatcher? If you want to apply for a dispatcher license, the first, uh, what you have to uh, fulfill is the requirement of the age. You must be at least 21 years old. So it's interesting because you have to be older than uh, to become a pilot, a professional pilot. And you must have a high school diploma 
Matura to uh, apply for the license. You must be in good health. Obviously, of course, the requirements for the health are not so high as for the pilots, but still you cannot have some uh, serious uh, illnesses that will that can affect you the, the work you perform. Uh, you must have a good knowledge of English. Mm, this is in Poland quite not regulated because theoretically there is no requirement, no uh, formal requirement for English language, like for example for the pilots where you have to, where you must have the ICAO level 4 uh, certificate. For flight dispatchers this is not the case, there is no such a requirement and totally theoretically you can do a mm, dispatcher license without uh, English language knowledge because also the state exam today, maybe it will change in, in the future, are held in Polish, but I'm sure that everyone who has anything to do in aviation uh, totally agrees that it is absolutely not possible to work in aviation without English uh, language, because all the documentation, all the manuals, all the uh, documents and everything and communication is done in English. So English is an aviation language, so I cannot imagine that one can go Uh, for apply for an, uh, for an, for any aviation job actually, without uh, at least an average knowledge of uh, English. And uh, also there is another very important uh, thing here in the in the requirements of for a person that this is a shift work. Uh, so as a dispatcher, you have to work 24 hours uh, uh, a day, seven uh, days a week, and 365 days a year. So you work on holidays, you work on weekends, and you work on Easter, on everything else. So you have to be ready to, to do it. Um, and of course, you work on night shifts. And uh, from my experience, I know that this is the biggest problem for some people, because even, even I have some, uh, I have a contact with, with guys who are trained for dispatcher, who want to be a dispatcher, but, and, who, and also who uh, completed the dispatcher training successfully. But then he started the work on shifts, and after a few months, he gave up because he said, "Sorry, I, I'm not able to work on night shifts." Uh, so, if you want to be a flight dispatcher, you must be ready to work on uh, shifts, definitely, and also day, day and night. Uh, in Poland, the shifts are 12 hours, which is, I think, uh, quite good. Uh, solution. So we have a 12-hour day shift and 12-hour night shift. Uh, It gives you about 12 uh, shifts a month. Uh, in other countries, for example, in Germany, the shifts are eight hours. So they are divided into three shifts. So we have early, late, and night shift. But of course, because it's only eight hour shifts, then you have more shifts during a month. So this is, in my opinion, in my personal opinion, this is a, a disadvantage of, of uh, this, uh, of this sol solution. Uh, okay, so now we can say uh, a few words how you can uh, become a licensed flight dispatcher in Poland. Well, the first thing you have to do, you have to look after a CTO. A CTO is a certified training organization. So an organization that is certified by the Polish aviation authorities and have a certificate, which can be validated on the uh, Polish CIA webpage and uh, apply for a course. Currently, in Poland, there are four CTOs. There are two in Warsaw, one in Helm, and one in uh, Gdańsk. Uh, well, I can say that one in Warsaw is a very, very good uh, CTO, is direct dispatch, as previous FDS. I graduated this CTO <laughs> 15 years ago. Uh, very experienced uh, dispatchers, they're very great uh, instructors. So for the Warsaw area, I think it's a very, very uh, good um, solution if you want to be a flight dispatcher. But we have now the latest uh, also CCTO in Gdańsk, in Lufthansa Systems Poland, uh, Aviation Academy, uh, where we also have very Uh, experienced uh, flight dispatchers, instructors uh, with uh, a lot of experience, and we are trying uh, now preparing our first uh, course that will start on the 19th of uh, September of uh, November. Uh, how does such a course uh, look like? Um, 
there is a theoretical part and the practical part. The first part, the theory, it depends from the CTO. Some have uh, 250, 260 hours of theory. Some have 300 hours of theory. We have, for example, 300 hours of theory. Uh, there are theoretical lessons in the classroom uh, from different subjects like meteorology, uh, air law, uh, aerodynamics, uh, aircraft constructions, etc., etc. There are, I think, 12 subjects that have to be uh, performed. Mm, then after this, you have to pass the state exam, theoretical exam. Um, and then you can do the practical, of, of course, you can uh, do the practical uh, part be before you, you pass the, the state exam, but you can also pass the state exam, the theory after the theoretical part. Then you have workshops of practical training. It's about 40 hours of uh, training where you are, uh, it's made in a, well, as I said, as a, as a workshop. So we have, you are working in a small groups, like three or four uh, people with an instructor, and then you are uh, learning directly uh, the job, how to, how to plan a flight. And after this, and there is one more thing, which is not directly related to the uh, CTO, you have to do uh, practice. So we have to do uh, on-job training, uh, and this is 90 shifts at an operator as a dispatcher assistant. So before you can obtain a license, because you can pass the exams earlier, but then you have to do the 90 shifts uh, to obtain the license. You will not obtain the license without uh, having those 90 shifts done at an operator as a flight dispatcher assistant. And after this, so after you uh, pass the exam, the theoretical exam, after you pass the practical exam then, and, uh, the, night and, the, and the shifts, the 90 shifts, then you will get your flight dispatcher license. And then you can start your job at yourself. Uh, but of course, I also have to mention that the flight dispatcher is one of those jobs uh, where experience is something very, very crucial. So this is not the paper that gives you the uh, ability to be a dispatcher, but the experience. So even after the 90 shifts, if you get the, uh, the license, then I think you need to work at least one or two years uh, as a dispatcher, or maybe later also, or maybe even also as dispatcher assistant to learn how it looks like and how to react in different situation. And uh, first then you can say that, okay, I am a flight dispatcher. I have a license and I have some experience so I can, uh, I can do something now. Okay, I hope um, I gave you a short introduction into our job. I hope you uh, will be interested <laughs> into getting a flight dispatcher because this is really, really a quite uh, interesting job, not uh, well known to the public, but this is a job that were, which is absolutely necessary um, for aviation, at least now. Uh, of course, automation is getting everywhere. We have bigger automation in the cockpit, as I mentioned before. Um, the aircraft can actually fly by themselves, but uh, we have, still have pilots there. And also the flight plans, they can also even today be made uh, most of them can be made automatically, but there must be a human uh, who is taking care about this and looking for errors and the errors still occur. So I think that for some more few years, we will still need flight dispatchers. And even if the automation process of the flight plan preparation will be so good that there will be no dispatcher needed for flight planning, there still will be flight dispatchers needed for, for flight monitoring or for flight watching. So for reacting in a situation that is uh, not, not common. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thanks, Swavek. Um, I'm pretty sure you got at least part of the guys and girls excited because I can see some questions already popping up. So um, why don't we start with the first one from the top? Um, what is the labor market like for dispatchers in Poland and Europe? Uh, well, the labor market is, uh, well, this is a difficult question at this moment because we have the pandemic. Luckily, we're getting out of the pandemic 
and uh, the aviation market is actually getting up. And we can see this also in the demand for dispatchers. Uh, as the operations uh, re return to uh, normal, because it returns to normal worldwide, uh, we see that the companies are still uh, hiring dispatchers. I know that at this moment, at least two companies in Poland uh, are looking for flight dispatchers. So there is definitely a need for for a flight for flight di di dispatchers. Of course, there will be not you know like uh, for everyone a, a, a job that is, is quite obvious. But uh, if you if you really want to to work in in this and you are willing to do it and uh, you are able to to do your best during the training, then you have big chances to 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 work and. Uh, what is also good that we have the ICAO license in Poland, which is recognized uh, worldwide. Um, so we can also go abroad and uh, abroad, especially in, in Western Europe. There are also many companies that are looking for dispatchers, even, even now. I've got uh, every, every month two or three job offers for a flight dispatcher. So there is definitely a requirement, a, a, a requirement for dispatchers right, right now. Okay, so it looks promising. So, so staying closely to the career path in the aviation business, here comes the second question. Um, is it possible to work only as a dispatcher after the course or does the course open the way to other aviation professions? Um, no, this is also a very mm, uh, good course because this is not only... Okay, of course, the course is for flight dispatcher. So it trains you to become a flight di di dispatcher. But uh, this is a general knowledge course in aviation. So uh, you can do this course and then you can go to work in handling or in uh, some areas of maintenance where are not very technical knowledge re required. And you can also treat it as the first step to your aviation career because it's affordable. Uh, price of a, a flight dispatcher course is like 8,000 or 9,000 zloty. This is just a small part of what a pilot's license, for example, cost. And for many people, uh, the flight dispatcher license is the first license on their way to the career. I know many, many guys, my colleagues, who started their career as a flight dis dis dispatcher. There was their uh, first license, and then they go to, then they became pilots late, late, later on, for example. And this is also a very good uh, situation, because if a pilot worked earlier as a flight dispatcher, he has a very, very good situation awareness regarding operations. So then when you talk with such a pilot, then uh, he knows what you are talking about. <laughs> so this is a very, very good uh, situation. So yes, this is a course which opens um, you the possibility to do many, many aviation jobs, not only to become a flight, flight dispatcher. Okay, thanks for the answer. Um, let me go through the question number three. And uh, while I'm doing that, please uh, feel free to turn your camera on, Slavik. So, so question number three, is it necessary to pass the exam and have a license after the course to be able to use the knowledge gained during the course? Uh, sorry, is my, com miss, um, my camera off? Yeah, it's off, but... Uh, sorry. Oh, no, it's yeah. on. Thanks so much. So, so let me read it again. Is it necessary to pass the exam and have a license after the course to be able to use the knowledge gained during the course? No, no. As I said before, it's. Uh, I also know many people that uh, who uh, graduated the course, and they didn't. Then they even don't wanted to make a license. So they even attempt to make a license. So just they just make the course. They have the cross certificate, uh, but they did not uh, make the license. And they work, for example, at, aer at airports. They work in handling. They work in uh, airport management. So they have the basic aviation knowledge, and they do not uh, have the the license. Right. Okay. Um, another question. Here it comes. Um, it might be interesting for you. What was the most bizarre ACARS message you have noticed when you were on duty? Uh, okay, I think it was the message, we don't have a flight plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. So what did you do? Yeah. There, there, there was such a situation that the air crew uh, was flying, uh, and uh, they are flying from a remote country outside the Euro control, outside the European zone, where we have common flight plan processing, and the flight plan was valid for the other countries, 
but it was not valid for the Euro control. There was a mistake made by the dispatcher <laughs> during the flight plan preparation, and it caused that the, there was flight plan only for a part of the flight. And uh, then we have to act to find the solution because, as I, as I said before, it's not possible to uh, mm, touch a flight that is active by the dispatcher. So when the flight departs, we cannot actually do anything with this flight directly, but we've called Euro control and we filed a new flight plan and we sent also the flight plan to the crew. So it ha everything uh, ended uh, ha happily. Wow. Well, that must have been stressful. So one last question from our end. Um, the question was sent by Rahul Kumar. Um, Hello, sir. I am from India. I learned a lot from your presentation. Am I eligible to train for dispatcher in Poland? Uh, well, um, yes and no. Well, yes, of course, you are eligible if you're only uh, able to, to study in Poland, so to come le le legally to Poland and stay here for a course. This is not, not a problem. But as I said, at this moment, the course is only in Polish because the exams are in Polish. So Polish language is at this moment a requirement. Right. I hope it will change in the future because we would like to also to perform the training in English because it's easier. It's honestly easier to perform an aviation training in English than in Polish. But uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense because if you go to the Polish CAA uh, for exam, then you have to pass it in Polish. We will try. We are trying to doing our best. We are still in contact with Polish CAA, and maybe there will be a solution for the future that we can switch also to English uh, exams, like, it's for, like, like it is, for example, with pilot li licenses. Right. So hopefully things will change um, shortly. Yeah. Because um, this, is all, this, will also, this will also open our market for the, or the much bigger area, right? Oh, definitely. You're right about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I think it's a good moment for a wrap-up. So um, thanks so much, Swavek, for bringing us, us um, a bit closer to the flight dispatcher's job. Uh, I personally find it amazing, and I really enjoyed the shows. Uh, and you. all of you, um, thank you for joining us today and following the um, Aviation Hub activity. We're being optimistic about the recovery from the pandemic, so stay tuned for the next events planned for the upcoming months. Um, there is one that is about to happen. Uh, it is uh, planned for the 23rd and 24th of November. It is the Aviation Hub Conference of 2021. So more news to come on that. Uh, stay healthy and therefore more of aviation. Bye-bye. Thanks for yeah, joining us bye. today. Bye.